Hello and welcome again to Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener intern, Tanisha Shadespain. This week we've got a lot of questions of yours to answer and also our panelists brought in a lot of really great show and tell items to show you. So let's jump in and have them introduce themselves and we'll get started. We'll start down with you. Okay. Hi, I'm Jim Schuster. I'm a retired extension plant pathologist with the University of Illinois. I'm John Bodensteiner. I'm a Vermilion County Master Gardener. Uh, I like uh, just about anything that grows in my yard or anybody else's yard, so. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois. An entomologist studies insects, so I'll do bug, bug type things and spiders, things of that nature. Creepy crawlies. Creepy crawlies. He's your man for that. Okay, so Jim, we're going to jump right in and start with you. You've got some show and tell items that right. you wanted to talk about. Yeah, and there is a disease that we call the Polonia tip blight. It attacks mostly the Austrian pine. It um, attacks when its new growth is coming out. And as the growth gets a little, maybe two thirds of the way grown, it's going to be dead. Uh, it attacks basically near the base of the new candle. Inside, if you scrape the bark off, it'll be chalk up brown to black. And that girdles everything from there out so that it dies. And it overwinters on the needles, on the sheath around the base of the needles, on the twig, and on the pine cones, whether it's green pine cone or brown pine cone. In fact, one of these scales has probably more spores on it than this whole twig had. Um, so if you, the older the tree gets, the more pine cone it gets, the more spores it has for reproducing and reinfecting the tree, which is why when it's kind of young, it looks like it's able to fight off the disease. That the older it gets, the faster it's declining because the spores are overwhelming its defenses. Uh, there are some fungicides you can try. You can also prune it out. But my recommendation is quit planting the Austrian pine. <laughs> Simple as that. Yep. Now, how long will it take for you to see that decline? Uh, you'll start seeing the decline maybe about 20 years after you planted it. Uh, the tree is usually 20 to 30 years old, and by 30, it's showing major. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just a tip light. That's all you have. That's not as big a deal because it's just the end of the branches. Mm -hmm. But it will eventually go into being a canker on the main branches and the trunk. And when it does that, it starts to become fatal. Gotcha, gotcha. So he says just quit planting them all together. <laughs> all right, all right, John, what did you bring? Um, what I brought today was a Chicago hardy fig. A, a lot of people question how I can grow figs, and this has been in my yard now for, oh, um, eight years, I think, eight or nine. And as you can see, even on here, you can see the, the um, little figs forming. This was one of the smaller shoots off of it. Uh, it's amazing, this, this tree will get to as high as my um, eave troughs on the house. Wow. And it freezes to the ground each year. They say it's zone five or six, but um, I have had, I've had figs every single year. And again, this is um, a small fig. What usually you wanna do is wait, uh, let them grow until they start to droop. As soon as they start to droop, that means that they're ripe and you can pick them. A lot of people wonder, Where's the flower? Actually, this is the flower. The outside of this is the petals and the, the uh, inside of the flower is actually inside of this. And there's, um, uh, if you wanted seeds, uh, usually we wouldn't get seeds in this area because there's a specific beetle or a wasp that actually will penetrate this little opening here. And that's how they'll get down in there. And the larvae are the ones that actually do the fertilization and they'll usually eat all the male type parts of the flower and then the female uh, parts are let alone but actually the the, the flower is 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 this but now, we know you're always in the kitchen so what do you do with these okay <laughs> these make wonderful jams and what is really good is if you can make a good jam and then put it over cream cheese uh, take your cream cheese and soften it and then put this over it and then put some crushed uh, uh, pecans over it and then use it as a cracker dip or just mm. spread it on I crackers. I knew you had a recipe. It, I is, knew it. it is just fantastic <laughs> and if you can add a little bit of pepper if you like it spicy you add a little bit of pepper to the jelly 
and oh, oh, oh. Wow, okay, all right. Moving on to Phil now, what have you, we're, oh, I, I, I guess we're gonna talk about bugs. Absolutely. Okay, okay. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Is there anything else to talk about? No, no, no that's <laughs> okay, it. I'm that's sorry. it. <laughs> At this time of year, and we're talking about late summer, early fall, end of the fall of the year, we have a variety of caterpillars that will get on trees and shrubs. And uh, I had some live caterpillars I was going to bring in, but uh, they weren't real. They were kind of soggy with rainfall and some things of this nature this morning. And uh, so I didn't know for sure if they were still there. So I brought in a model uh, of a caterpillar. And this actually is a black swallowtail caterpillar that you'd find on your parsley or your fennel or your dill. But we're going to talk about caterpillars on trees because they all kind of do the same type of damage. And that is they eat holes in the leaves and can eat the whole leaf off. Holes and leaves, whole leaf, you know, be your way. Uh, leaving just the, uh, just the main veins and so on. And so this is a, a, f a factor that tends to, tends to occur. And there's a number of caterpillars that get on trees in the fall. One of them is called fall webworm believe it or not, <laughs> and, uh, and it makes these webbings on the ends of the tree branches and so on. We'll feed on that. We have a lot of yellow neck caterpillar, which tend to show up, uh, walnut caterpillars, second generation white marked tussock moths, uh, or, or white marked tussock moths can, can, find a, can, can hang on to this late, a late generation, not really a second generation. And you end up, a lot of people don't only notice them because uh, the tree's overhanging the patio or the driveway, and all, these, all of a sudden uh, you see all of these uh, granules, uh, dark areas that, uh, that uh, caterpillar feces falling down on, oh. on it. And people get all bent out of shape, and then they look up and they say, hey, part of my tree leaves have been eaten off. Uh, we really don't need to worry too much about these fall uh, caterpillars. And part of that is associated with some information that, uh, that has come out. And what it essentially indicates is that in a normal year, uh, a tree will be going across and will have a certain amount of, uh, of energy and it will get to where it needs to put on leaves and a lot of root growth occurs in the spring of the year and you'll see a dip in the amount of energy level that it has. And then it, and then it comes back up and stays high until leaf drop and it goes into the winter with a large amount of energy or food in the tree. Uh, with a spring caterpillars, such as gypsy moth and eastern tent caterpillar and, some of, and canker worms and some of those things, what you see is will happen here is that you have a dip to, to create leaves and roots, but then you'll get defoliation and that, and that energy level dips even more because the tree has to refoliate, put new leaves on, and you can see at the end of the year, it never quite gets back to the amount of energy that it had if, if it would have been a normal year. And so it goes into the next year with too much, too little energy. And so those are the caterpillars we really get concerned about, which is why we have programs in trying to keep down gypsy moth and some of these other things that are a problem, is because of that factor. Late season defoliators, such as what I'm talking about today, they're coming in here and they're kind of fit in just with the defoliation that's occurring anywhere from about mid-July to late July through. And so, although you may not like the looks of it, don't worry about the health of your tree. Same reason why we don't see any real problems with Japanese beetles feeding on the leaves of trees. They come out around the 1st of July and will feed through about the middle to the latter part of <coughs> August. But although they make the trees kind of look funky and brownish and maybe with no leaves on them, the trees do fine under that for years and years and years. And the reason is it's hitting in that second half of the growing season, not the first half. We had Japanese beetles coming out in May. It would be a serious problem killing trees, things of that nature. So when it occurs the time, so the bottom line that you take away from this, your, your moral of the story is late season caterpillar. If you want to control them, you can, but don't feel you need to, to protect that tree because it's all right. It'll do fine as long as that defoliation isn't so early that the trees will refoliate, and that rarely happens in these types of caterpillars. That's really good to know, because I feel like you're right. A lot of people get bent out of shape because they don't know if it's harming the tree, but right. it sort of just fits right in with the schedule of things. And it kind of goes, well, I don't know for sure, so let's spray it anyway. Yeah. Well, find out for sure. <laughs> exactly. All right, wonderful. Thank you. All right, Jim, we're going to go back to you and All talk right. about fire blight. Right. Fire blight is a rose family disease. And it's a bacterial disease, so we basically have not uh, any effective control for it, except for pruning it out. Uh, it likes wet weather, 
The wetter it is, the better it likes it. However, it does not like hot weather. So even though this past summer we've had a lot of rain through the central part of Illinois, it also got in in the 90s, and Fireblade does not like the 90 degree heat. It prefers the 70s and 80s, and then if it was in the 70s and 80s with all that rain we had, you would have had some really badly damaged trees. Uh, but basically, most of the time, fire blight <coughs> will cause the tip of the new growth to curl back on itself, causing a shepherd's crook. And in some cases, it will turn black. In other plants, it will be a chocolate brown color. Uh, but that does not always have to happen. On some trees, the branch will stay straight, even though it's got fire blight. And then there are other plants that will get a shepherd's crook due to drought or drowning mm -hmm. and not have fire blight. So one of the first things you want to make sure is <coughs> your plant is in the rose family. And by the way, the rose itself is one of the most resistant plants to fire blight. Interesting. So anyway, <laughs> but basically with fire blight, you prune it out. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, John, you've got some other goodies to yes, share. Yes, I've got a email that we got in, and it's from Laura. And she is wondering, is there a perennial hibiscus and an annual hibiscus? If so, how can you identify the perennial? When you say it's an annual, it's, you may mean that it's a tender perennial in that if you don't bring in the tropical hibiscus, it is technically an annual. They are all basically perennials, but you have to treat them differently. <clears throat> now, I did bring in a few samples. <coughs> this is the tropical one. You can see it's got much shinier leaves. They're kind of heart-shaped. And uh, this, is, this is the one that you have to bring in. And I would bring it in at when it gets to 50 degrees or if you think it's going to get below 50 degrees, you need to bring it in. Even though it's not going to freeze, a lot of people keep these out, they're not going to do well. And it's going to put a lot of stress on them. When you bring it in, it probably still is going to lose its leaves. It's nothing to worry about. Yeah, if you, if you, if you want it as a showpiece in the house, it's probably not going to be that. Uh, there are some new... Um, shorter varieties that tend to keep their leaves and, and and we had two of them this winter that really did well all through the winter kept their leaves flowered throughout the winter and so but the, as you can see much shinier leaves mm -hmm. uh, the flowers aren't quite as large as the the perennial one that I call the perennial and um, again you ha at 50 degrees is, is magic uh, if you leave it outside it's probably not going to do too well now uh, getting back to your definition of annual or perennial, there are also some trees. Uh, Rosa Sharon, some people call that a hibiscus. And rose mallow, that's <clears throat> almost like a um, an another plant. And it has kind of flowers like that, but it's different than these. Now, talking about the perennial, this is the perennial. This that's is gorgeous. This is called, some people call this a dinner plate. And you can see why. It's it's fairly fairly large. I'm surprised that these kept their 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 that they open because usually these last one day and then they they close up and fall off. And I have a couple of them. This one here got broke off, but as you can see, they're they're very beautiful, very tropical looking too. Mm -hmm. And uh, but this is the perennial, and you can see the difference between this leaf, oh, which definitely. is shiny, and this, which is almost almost like a uh, maple shape or something mm -hmm. like that. But this is the perennial, and this is what the, the, the buds look after they've closed. But, um, and here's another one that, uh, this is, that they'll put out seeds, but... Um, Those are so beautiful, they almost look artificial. They, they, yeah, <laughs> and I just, I went out in the rain this morning, and this was, this was what I, I met me out in the garden this morning, was these two. And, but again, these have their place. Uh, make sure I didn't forget anything. I store um, inside in the sun. Um, so if you bring them in, they need to be in a sunny window for right, the winter. Right, and, and keep, don't put them in, in an unheated garage or someplace like that where they're gonna, again, get below 50 degrees. These are gonna die back to the ground and they may take a while to come up in the spring, but never fear, I've never had one. And 
uh, that doesn't like it. Now, Jim, you were saying that up in Chicago they didn't do as well, but here in central Illinois, they do. I, I have never had one in, that uh, has failed, and each year they get a little bit bigger. And uh, this is an, a new one that I found, and I just love the, the deep, deep mm -hmm. red. So. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Okay, thank okay. you very much. All right, Phil, we're going to go back to you with another show and tell item. Okay, <clears throat> we get uh, gardeners who are interested in wanting to know how to control their pests, whether it's insects, weeds, or diseases. And what we recommend is called IPM, or Integrated Pest Management. That's a different IPM than Illinois Public Media, by the way. <laughs> That's Integrated Pest Management. It's been around for about 80, 70 years, 60 years, something like that. At any rate, uh, a book that, that's available in extension offices is, uh, is Pest Management for the Home Garden. Had to check because they've changed the title a couple, three <laughs> times in the duration. I've been kind of in charge of this, this book, uh, but uh, coordinator of it. But it has several chapters in it that get into the various types of insects, weeds, and diseases that you have in the home landscape. And it's available at your local extension office. And it's relatively inexpensive. I think it's 25 bucks or something like this. And we can have, use the same one for several years. In the last chapter of a book, it gets into, into what is called uh, integrated pest management and pesticide safety. And, uh, and in the, uh, a lot of it's written on, on how, to, how to handle pesticides properly and so on. But the first four pages or so of that particular chapter is, uh, is on integrated pest management. And it goes through for the gardener how to, uh, how to manage weed diseases and insect problems and to get away from the idea that it's Tuesday, so this is the day I spray everything. This is not the way to control, control uh, pests. Is it, Tanisha? You're no, a master gardener now. You I'm know that. I'm an intern. An intern. There intern. you go. Intern. I've got to get my hours. And in. so there <laughs> is information associated with that uh, in that in that in this book, and it kind of goes through the idea that you that you look before you spray, mm -hmm. and you consider non-chemical methods before you spray, and you do just about anything before you spray. Okay. <laughs> and so uh, and so it's important to to scout for for insects or weeds or diseases, determine what they are. And, uh, and then look at the various options that are there, and particularly for the home gardener, uh, there are usually many non-chemical options that are available to them. Less so for the professional, because one of the things that pesticides do for people, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, is they're a labor saver. And you wouldn't want to pay the bill for your landscaper to be picking bugs off of things or pulling out individual weeds. Uh, you would not want to pay that labor bill. And so a lot of pesticides are used as labor-saving devices, which because when you're out there doing gardening work, this is supposed to be a leisure time activity. You're supposed to really enjoy picking bugs off of plants and squishing them or doing or pulling <laughs> out weeds and, and getting little prickles in your fingers and things like this. This is enjoyment. Remember that. Say that over and over to yourself so you understand <laughs> that, okay? And so this is all part of, of Integrated Pest Management, or IPM. Uh, now, if you really want to get into it a little bit heavier, I will, I will shamelessly promote a book, and that is uh, <laughs> IPM for Gardeners, of which I am one of the three authors on it, and this is through Timber Press. And it gets into more detail, of course, with 250 pages. It's a little bit more detailed than the four pages in, in the pest manual, a pest, pest control manual. But at any rate, uh, this is, uh, I think uh, every copy that's sold, I get 75 cents out of or something. Big so. money. Big money, big money, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, uh, yeah, put it all to money, money, you go out to eat. Maybe. There you but, go, uh, there you go. This was put out in, in 2004. It's now a print-on-demand book, mm -hmm. but uh, but they can, they can can you can get it through uh, through the Timber Press or, or some bookstores have it and so on. And it gets more into depth as far as, uh, as what's available mm -hmm. and what you can do to, uh, to look at, at promoting integrated pest management within your own garden. Commercial people have been doing it for decades uh, and, uh, and it's so, so seamless that many of us don't even realize that they're doing it. It's, they come out and look for it first. Well, why did you come out and look first? It's part of IPM. Mm -hmm. okay. I like how they, like you were mentioning, there are so many other steps and so many things to explore before you reach for that pesticide or right. that spray. And then the other thing that I learned was that you don't want to get rid of everything. It's not like, right. it's not realistic. You want to be able to manage your space well, but you're not going to have a, a pest-free 
garden. Yeah, integrated pest management is, is, is an ecological way of controlling pests. Mm -hmm. you, why do you not want to get rid of everything? If you got rid of everything, your predators and parasitic insects would, would starve to death because there's nothing there to mm -hmm. feed on. Mm -hmm. And so by having some left, it keeps that standing army there to help you. Mm -hmm. so that you don't lose all your plants the next time they, they build up in number. You've got, you've got some critters there that, that can help you out, some predators and parasites and so on. And so it's all a factor of, of and that's the way natural ecological systems do. Absolutely. Not all of the insects or all of the pests or all of the weeds or all of the diseases mm -hmm. ever die out. But, uh, but there's always a small level there and it's keeping their controlled methods that are there put there by, by nature to mm -hmm. help control things. And, and this is what we try to promote in, uh, in gardening with IPM, or Integrated Pest Management. And my sweet husband, bless his heart, he has to come and get the hornworms for me because I'll be in there working and <laughs> boom, and I'll just, <laughs> And then he has to come and get it for me. So that's my integrated pest management is my just, husband. Just think, too, if we didn't have insects in the spring, our birds wouldn't have anything to feed to their, to their babies because that's basically almost 100% of their food. Mm -hmm. There's some great information. And there. it would be no lice to eat the birds. <laughs> yeah. so, there we go. I always look at it. What comes around goes around. There we go. There we when go. When it comes to bugs. All right, Jim, we're going to go back down to you. Uh, mm -hmm. A question from Allison. Could I uh, say oh, sure, one thing? Oh, sure, sure. I want to build on uh, Phil's comment about IPM applying to diseases. I kind of was kind of facetious about not planting any offering pine. That's not really true. But what you want to do is yet you don't over plant any one kind of tree. You know, it may be whether it's a maple of a certain kind, like Norway's, mm -hmm. or you're all planting. Uh, you want to look at your neighborhood, which is two miles in every direction. Wow. And make sure by genus that you do not plant more than 10% of that genus. Mm. That minimizes the whole neighborhood and getting wiped out because they're all the same tree and getting a disease. So, uh, you know, look at your neighborhood, drive up and down the street, looking at how many of th this maple you got or how many oaks you got or how many white pine versus uh, Austrian pine and keep the population in your yard to less than 10% in your neighborhood. And that minimizes the diseases. Now there are diseases that are gonna blow away from Texas, so can't help that. But at least you minimize the immediate disease mm -hmm. by minimizing the number of, of the plants that are the same kind. Now we can okay. Yeah. Do this an an old old rule of thumb it's always been is if you live into a new housing de uh, housing development, you wait until everybody else around you plants their trees and shrubs. Yeah. Identify what they are and then plant something different. Mm -hmm. That's right. Gotcha. Let everybody yeah. else go first, and then <laughs> right. you jump in. So okay. you don't have yeah. the same thing. Okay. All right. Okay. Back to you, Jim. Mm -hmm. um, Allison writes in. How do I get rid of black spots on the leaves of flowering vines and plants? They are dark black circles, and some leaves have a few spots, while others have many. Okay. Well, there are more than one kind of fungi that cause black spots. Not all of them are going to be controllable, because some of the black spots are caused by bacteria, which most for homeowners, we don't have much control for them. Mm -hmm. Other ones are fungal, and there's at least <coughs> three fungal uh, diseases that I know that cause black spots on some plants, but there are brown spots on other plants. Um, and some of these fungi do cross genuses. They're not just locked into a maple or uh, your uh, ivy or whatever. And so that's one of the problems is getting the actual disease properly identified to know if you can even have a fungicide that works on it. So if you've got these spots, you're going to want to be sending these to a lab to get them verified. So the next year, if there is a fungicide, you can pr spray preventively. You can't cure them. Once you've got the spots, you're kind of locked in. Now this one is showing right now is tar spot on mm -hmm. a maple. It doesn't do much to a tree besides make it look like I got tar on my leaf. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I actually think that kind of looks neat from a disease point of view. Uh, this one is, uh, and there's uh, several different species of this fungus and they, the, this one here makes it a really dark black spot, tar spot because it's packed with uh, spores. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that's on your Norways that occurs even easier uh, is more open and has fewer black pustules, so you see more brown uh, between the pustules. In both of them, ignore it. And if it bothers you, quit looking up. 
okay? <laughs> it's not one that we're going to recommend you spray for because it doesn't do enough damage to the tree to justify a spray. Yeah. I mean, it's mostly cosmetic. And, and that, on those other pictures you were seeing, most of those are cosmetic. And they're not causing you defoliation or your defoliation is less than 10% of the total foliage. Mm -hmm. Leave it alone. As a part of our IPM, don't treat if you don't have to. Yeah. I bet a lot of people struggle with that, though. Yeah. Just oh, yeah. from the calls that we get in, they see a spot, they want to know how to get rid of it immediately. Yeah. So. Well, I have had people call it because I got one spot on a, a tree with 100,000 leaves. Yeah. Well, pull a one leaf off then. Exactly. Just get rid of that yeah. one. All right, yeah. gentlemen, thank you so much for coming in today. And thank you so much for joining us. As always, you can find us on all of our social media channels. Look for us on Facebook and Instagram. And check out our podcast wherever you podcast. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. Good night.